Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa. Thank you for tuning in and spending some time. I have a new webinar that I have recorded that's available if you're interested. It's about how to want sex more or help your partner too, <laughs> without pressure and obligation. And so you could find that at intimacywithease.com slash masterclass. Uh, it's my latest culmination of all this stuff I talk about. If you've been listening for a while, it may not surprise you, but it's put together in a way to hopefully get some clarity to really unblock desire. Because like I say, I'm always trying to help people not, I don't want people to have more sex. I want people to want as much sex as they can want. That's my mission. So in that vein, today I'm talking to Shana James and the topic officially is how men can talk about their sexual desires. But even right from the get go, it's like, why men? What do you mean by men? Isn't this all people? (laughs) So it really morphs into more of a broad conversation about how can people talk about their sexual desires. And sometimes we're talking about the higher desire person specifically, but really it applies to everybody. So while we use some gendered pronouns in here, it's really applicable across the board. And I think no matter who you are, which end of the spectrum, Uh, In terms of level of desire, which whatever part of the spectrum of gender you are on, I think there's a valuable takeaway in how to honor your desires, talk about those desires, bring vulnerability to those conversations, and, you know, really ultimately create a win-win with your partner so that that you're creating a sex life that you both really enjoy. I hope you like the episode. And before we start the show today... It is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. So Shana, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. So why don't we start off because you and I were chatting before I hit record about, you know, the topic is how men can talk to their partners about sex and their sexual desires. But let's just address right up front. Why men? What do you mean by men? (laughs) Is it really for all people? What do you think? I mean, in some ways, this is for all people. I tend to work with men who are heterosexual or, you know, people who were born male, heterosexual relationships with women, because I do this overlap of you know, helping them understand what a woman might be thinking, or I get to step into the shoes of here's a woman, you know, in front of you. And I don't speak for all women, but this is the impact that's happening in the moment. So I extend this beyond gender for sure. And I also don't often like to speak about what I don't know about or what isn't my life experience. Yeah. But we can go wherever, wherever feels right. With this. Okay. So basically it's a heterosexual framework in general with the, with the people you work with and we're going to talk about this, but where it fits for anybody who's listening, it doesn't have to doesn't be help. those roles, right? Okay. Exactly. Maybe you could just start talking a little bit about how you've gotten even into this work. <laughs> what, what's, what's been the draw to this for you? Yeah. Well, I'll say from a very young age, I was confused by my parents' relationship and I had a mother and a father and, you know, very cisgendered, very (laughs) conservative and not a lot of education in communication and respect in, you know, emotional intelligence and all of that. And so I just was very confused and hurt and was trying to help them love each other. <laughs> it was like a part of like, okay, well, maybe I can help here. And the therapist uh, in me just goes, oh boy. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. As we're younger. And yeah, so I think in some ways I catapulted out of my family trying to understand love and 
communication and how two people could grow and be happy and connected and nurtured. And, you know, I wasn't necessarily sure if that was possible, but I wanted to try. Yeah. Okay. So where do people go wrong? I mean, like, where do couples go wrong? If you've got a man or a woman or not, like, where are these communication breakdowns? What are the typical hurdles you're trying to help people overcome? Yeah. One of the things that stands out to me is respect. That when we're with a romantic partner, we tend, people tend, or people can give themselves more leeway to treat a partner disrespectfully than we would with a friend or, you know, someone else out in the world. There's a lot of like what goes on behind closed doors versus our social persona. Yeah. So I realized after leaving my parents' house, you know, it, it took me a long time. It's still taken me a long time, but it took me a divorce until I actually made that commitment to myself. Like I am not going to have disrespectful things come out of my mouth. And I'm not perfect, but it really was a 180 shift from, oh, I'm just going to say what I'm feeling, or I'm going to name call, or I'm going to blame, or I'm going to be like, I'm mad at you because of this. You know, I, it really, to me, when I look back at my marriage, there were some times where I wasn't in control of my emotional response or of my words and my communication. And I saw that that really eroded the foundation of trust in our relationship. So if, if you are, if we're going to be talking about how men can talk to their partners about the sexual desires, and again, in my own head, I'm thinking maybe we're talking about higher desire per- partners, no matter what gender they are. Right, no matter what gender, yeah. What gets in the way for the lower desire partner or the woman, if that's who's in that role? What kinds of things make somebody not want sex or say no to the sex or, you know, no to these conversations? Well, I think when there isn't a clear conversation or when the conversation leans into the complaining mode (laughs) than the inspiring mode, you know, that can really get in the way. And so if someone, and I actually did this in my marriage, I will own up to this where I was like, why isn't our sex life like this? I want this and this isn't happening versus, Oh, I would, it would be amazing, you know, if this were to happen or here's what I really want. And, you know, there's a, there's a, an energy of, passion and excitement and collaboration that comes through in our desires. And when the complaint is there, you know, someone just ends up feeling wrong or bad. And I've worked with many, many people on this, men and women, both, or, you know, people of all genders and this, right. The complaint. And then the other thing that just came to my mind is the way that we can, as a lower desire person can sometimes just squash your own desires or your own sense of, I would really like it to be this way, but it's hard for me to ask for that. I guess this could be either, right? High desire yeah. or desire. Yeah. I want something, but I either don't think that I deserve it. I don't think that that is what a good person would want. I might think it's dirty. I might think it's weird, you know? And so when we are either hiding our desires or apologizing as we bring our desires, both of those have this dynamic of turning somebody off rather than turning them on or bringing them closer. So while some people might be talking about their desires, they're tainting it with that energy in a way, like this is shameful or dirty or putting me off, even though I can't put my finger on that. Yeah. And it's a very, again, it's a very different energy. And and I'm not saying that people are perfect. And if you are feeling shame, it's not like suddenly you have to just bring the inspiration. I mean, that's where you come in or I come in, right? I work yeah. with a lot of people where we're talking about what are your desires and what feels shameful about that. I have this one story that I just love where a man I was working with said that he was holding on to this idea that he was perverted since he was like six years old and had had an experience with a young girl and when he said that, he was like, yeah, you know, and maybe I'm perverted. And I, I said to him, you mean in a bad way? And he just started laughing because yeah. it was like the energy around it, like, oh, well, okay. We have perverted thoughts. You know, we have kinky thoughts. We have wild and crazy thoughts. And so that if we can actually work that through and not feel ashamed about our desires, you know, I believe that our desires are good. Then mm-hmm. we get co-create or collaborate in a consent, you know, with consent, but 
innately our desires. There's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. So what makes somebody, uh, I mean, let's say it's a woman in this scenario here, say no to sex or affection, even if they want it. Is it that shame around their own pleasure and desires or is there more going on, more reasons that that might happen? I think there are more reasons. I think definitely it can be shame. You know, if somebody doesn't want to be seen as too slutty or too prudish or too this or too that, right? Yeah, all of that shame can come in. I also think when people aren't feeling seen or understood, And when they're not feeling like the other person wants to see or understand them, when it's more about the other person's agenda to get a need met, but it's separate, right? Like it's not a connected thing. I think that's often when I see people say no. And I think that can be hard for us to realize because I never want to shut down someone's agenda, right? Oh, I want to have more sex or I want to feel more connected or more intimate, And if there isn't a sense on the other side of curiosity, like what is this other person want? What does my partner want? What would feel good? What doesn't feel good? You know, then it becomes this, it's like separate teams instead of more collaboration where we actually feel emotionally connected also. Right. That reminds me of how I talk about it. If if sex is becoming, or really anything in a relationship, zero sum game, I win, you lose. When couples are struggling with this, so much of it feels like that. You want more sex. If you know you win, if you get it, I lose if I give in or, you know, whatever. Or we got to have it your way or, you know, rather than it's a win-win situation that we're both getting, creating a sex life we both want. And the context of the relationship in general, right? Because I think you're saying somebody doesn't feel heard and understood in general. Right. And that, and that can be surprising too, that it's not just in the bedroom. Yeah. Right? It's very connected to the relationship outside of the bedroom. And if somebody's heart isn't connected to you in the way they want, if there's a you know sensitive person, it might be the woman. It might be, well, I work with a lot of men who actually are the more sensitive one in their relationship. Mm-hmm. And they have this longing to be connected with and to have that, those kind of invisible, I call it invisible intimacy or, you know, the invisible factors of intimacy, like that they want to feel bonded in that way. And when they don't, you know, for some men, it's like, I can't really get an erection, especially getting older. Yeah. Like the emotional is very, very tied to the physical. Yeah. I I find in my practice, I mean, I don't want to say it's a hundred percent, but it's so common that one person really wants to feel emotionally connected and close before they're open to sex. And the other person, it's through sex that they feel that closeness. And it's like this, this horrible joke of the universe, you know, and I'm always telling couples, you got to work on both of those because it can't be that one comes first. It's chicken and egg, right? They both need attention. Right. Yeah. They both need attention. And I think one of the things I also find that has people say no is when one person is in their head So it's more of this intellectual thing. So I think this ties into what you were saying too. It's like the more two people are actually aware of their bodies and paying attention to their bodies and what feels good and what doesn't feel good, there's more of a connection that's already happening before being in the bedroom, Mm -hmm. you know, before sex happens. Yeah. And so I think it makes it easier for people also to, again, collaborate and connect on these deeper levels. And it's like, oh then there's more playfulness too, or more of an exploratory nature. Like what happens when we do it this way? And let's see what happens when we do it that way. Maybe tonight we're going to play with doing some kind of emotional connection first. And maybe tomorrow we're going to try. And, you know, we always, we can have safe words or ways where it's like, well, this is not working for me. We're having sex and I'm not emotionally connected enough yet, but maybe it, it happens, you know, in the bedroom or with some physical contact versus another night where, There isn't. So I just, I love making it a little less serious and more of a let's explore and let's experiment and see what we like and what we don't like. Yeah. I literally tell people to consider sex like going to the playground. Yes. I don't mean that in a childish way, but it it can be light. And and if you really wrap your mind around this, you realize you actually can't fail. Like it can't be a failure. So. Yeah. And I was talking to another client recently where he was worried, like, well, what if I, you know, what if I don't get harder? What if I lose my erection part of the way through? And I was like, okay, well, let's, let's look at that. What if you do? Yeah. What, what would happen? What are the worst fears? And then how could you actually come from a place of self-love or a place of empowerment rather than collapsing into I'm horrible and kind of going down that shame spiral or being like, ah, you know, attacking back and, 
you know, you're this, you're that, right? What's that middle ground? Yeah. So besides going in with more of a playful, light, exploratory attitude, what kind of advice or coaching do you give, I'll say men, this placeholder, <laughs> to help their partner feel safe, to get aroused, to want to be sexual? Yeah. So there's the playful part. And then I also work a lot with the vulnerability part and the honesty and, you know, a man bringing the context of why he wants to, if this is a man again, why he wants to have sex, not just, I want to get off or I want to feel pleasure, but you know, what else gets to happen? Oh, I feel more ease in my body. Then when I look at you, I feel this bond. I feel this love, like the love starts to, you know, flow through me or whatever it may be. I have an easier time parenting when, you know, we've bonded and we've gotten out of our heads and left the busy days and the craziness and the pandemic and whatever behind. And, you know, there's a vulnerability in being able to say, this is what I really need. And this is what I really want. But, you know, not with pressure or attachment often, but that kind of vulnerability of, right, if I could have it anyway, this is what would actually nourish me. This is what would actually feel good to me. Yeah, it's so true because I don't know that people are necessarily talking about the longing they have to feel close and how much they feel connected through this. And there can be this myth that goes on that this guy just wants to get off. And it's like the furthest thing from the truth for most people, right? They really want to connect with their partner. They want to share, you know, they might want to have an orgasm, but they want to share that experience with somebody in a really meaningful way. Right. Otherwise they could give themselves an orgasm. Right. It doesn't feel as good. Hey, this is Jess. I'm just taking a quick break and I want to make sure you know about the guide I wrote about how to talk to your partner about sexual concerns. This comes up a lot in my practice. People have struggles and it takes them so long to bring it up with their partner. They're afraid that that conversation is going to go badly. Their partner's going to be upset. The partner's going to be defensive, or they just don't know how to talk about sex and sexual problems. Common, common problem. So I wrote this guide that really helps you address this. It helps you prepare for the conversation how to introduce the conversation, and then tips about how to actually get through the conversation so that you can change things with your partner as a team. If you are interested in this guide, you can find it at bettersexpodcast.com slash guide. Again, bettersexpodcast.com slash guide. Happy to send it to you. And I think when we also assume the best about our partners, then we can start to see, oh, well, maybe there is a way that this person wants to get off, but doesn't even realize what's possible, right? That there's more possible. Maybe this person was trained through porn or through, you know, lack of education that there was something else possible. And what if, if I come from compassion and I'm assuming the best, oh, this person is actually trying to get what, you know, he, she, they needs, it's like, oh, then I could start to not take it personally or be offended. And then we could start to explore and collaborate together. So these conversations can be hard to have. I mean, you know, I see people in therapy who have, I mean, I guess they've had enough of a conversation to make an appointment, but sometimes people have gone like decades without talking about their sex life and their sexual connection, right? So what kind of advice or ideas you give people around how to even start to, how do they actually have the conversation? I mean, one of the conversations that I like to have people have before they have the conversation about sex is how are we treating each other? Again, back to respect. How are we relating to each other's desires? You know, are we shooting them down? Are we saying, no, that's not me. I I would never do something like that. Or are we actually open to brainstorming together hearing what the other person wants, you know, maybe even stretching a little bit to entertain an idea of something that I've never done before. And I never thought I would do, but huh, okay, might I do this? And if so, what would I need to feel more comfortable or to feel safer or to feel more connected? So I like first having that conversation, you know, a little going a little bit meta, having Mm -hmm. the conversation about how are we having conversations with each other? Yeah. 
And then from there, I like to support people to really come from curiosity. And again, you know, that, that brainstorming mode rather than we're making decision making mode. Yeah. Let's just start to kind of dream and get to know each other without anything necessarily even needing to happen yet. And let's see where we align and where we don't align. And, you know, in the places where we don't align, we could, we could look at those a little bit later and see what creative ways we might want to get those needs met. But at first we could actually focus on the places where we do feel aligned. Does that play into your model of ABC communication? What is that? <laughs> yeah, communication. One of the things I find is that, and again, this could be any gender. I often find this with men who are identify as nice guys or pleasers where they might say something And then if they're in a heterosexual relationship, a woman would say something back and would be like, no, or I don't like that. Or how dare you say something like that? Right. And then that's seen as the end. So A is the first communication, B is the second. And then I, men come to me and they're like, I just walked away and that was it. And I'm like, okay, you missed C, right? C could be something like, oh, I noticed that you seem really upset by that. Or Hey, wow, that was that was a response that was really surprising to me. Like I thought I was bringing something that you might like. It sounds like you really didn't like that or you know something else happened. What what was going on for you? So, you know, C I just think of as ABC, but as I'm saying it could also be this curiosity. Yeah. And if we're not taking things as personally, then we could start to see which which happens the more, you know, self-esteem and the more we actually recognize ourselves and our desires is good then we could come back and say, wow, tell me more about that. You seem like you want to bite my head off. Okay. Like I want to understand what's going on with you. Yeah. Yeah. Those are exactly the moments to be curious instead of defensive or shut down or walk away. And it just strikes me how many people either don't even get to be like, they don't say a, because they already anticipate B or I'm reading, she looks tired tonight. So I'm already going to back off from this, or maybe it's not even a, no, I don't like that, but just sort of a slight shift in energy. Like they're they're so, you know, people can be so sensitive and they take the slightest read as oops, that door is shut and then, and then give up on on themselves and their desires. I know as a people pleaser myself, I've definitely, I have this one very vivid memory where I was laying in bed with a partner and I really wanted to have this conversation that felt you know, vulnerable to me. And I I wanted to have it, but I looked at him and I was like, he's exhausted. There's no way he's going to be up for this. And I told him the next day, like, I wanted to talk about this, but you look so tired. And he was like, why, why didn't you ask me? I was like, Oh, I do this thing where I, I look at people's facial expressions and they're like, I just, you know, all the signs of how might I be inconveniencing this other person. And so that can happen again, whatever gender you are, you could be that kind of pleasing type or nice guy or good girl or, you know, nice person trying not to make anybody uncomfortable, but then we end up usually really resentful and pissed off. Yeah. Over time, right. You can't, you can't not pay attention to your desires for too long or it's going to fester. A backlash. Yeah. And what about, I mean, I don't know if this totally fits from what we were just talking about, but I have this question in my mind because I see this with clients is this idea that somebody who's again, and maybe it's man, maybe it isn't, the higher desire person is interested in having more sex. And there's some dynamic where the other person feels like they're looking for a fix and I'm the the dealer. Yeah, You know, like they, they want this thing and it's on me to give it. And it creates this really unhealthy pressure and it almost changes the meaning of sex. And people find themselves there all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, I want this thing. I'm married to you. or I'm committed to you. You're the only place I can get it. And then it it becomes really toxic. Yeah. Is that something you coach people around? It is. And, you know, there's a couple of pieces of it. One, I, I don't know. I always get a little scared to say this, but, you know, we are way more creative than our culture gives us credit for, right? So there are a lot of people who are in monogamish relationships or Mm -hmm. who have other partners or who go to ecstatic dance and, you know, just have like that intimacy and connection or there's cuddle parties and, you know, places where people can get that need for intimacy or touch met. And 
So I never like to keep it in the box of, well, you have no other option. Now that may not be an option in a monogamous relationship. And for someone who's you know never had that conversation or never dreamt of it, then I think we've got to work with it together. Yeah. And right. I think the, again, the energy of resentment and irritation and righteousness does not go over very well. Yeah. It re- reminds me of what you were saying about the energy of apology or shame. If you come in with entitlement or desperation, like any of these different flavors are not going to be appealing to your partner. Yeah. Which is a really good reason again, to seek out some help and, you know, work with someone to, to work through that because at the root of the apology is shame at the root of the entitlement is shame, right? It's like, Oh, what is causing us to not have a positive relationship with our own sexuality? I mean, I think we can take responsibility and there are some times where we can have sex with ourselves. Yeah. That, that's our partner our isn't in the mood, right? It's always an option and it doesn't have to just be, it doesn't have to be like a quick and dirty with ourselves. Right. Actually. Right. You can have spiritual, incredibly pleasurable, wild experiences. You can get to know your body. I think it's actually really powerful to realize someone else is not in charge or responsible for my sexual desires. Right. And again, I think when there's respect and there's actually, I, I don't see a lot of people who have what you described sitting down and having really vulnerable conversations about it. Yeah here's how it is for me on my end. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Here's how it is for me on my end. Okay. Right. Like what's, what is most vulnerable about this for each of us and how can we then try to collaborate to meet these needs? Yeah. I think you're right because if people are in this dynamic, there's already a desperation. There's already a, you have to give this to me. I'm entitled to this. Why don't you love me? I mean, it goes down. It's like a whole rabbit hole, right? Instead of just sitting down saying, hey, here's what's up for me and what gets activated and what I'm longing for. And and some, you know, thinking about what your partner wants too, that it's not just about satisfying your own needs. It's like- Right, like what would make this exciting or inspiring for you? Yeah, yeah. It may be people, I, I like to say that people have fantasies that aren't always sexual, right? There can be emotional fantasies. There can be, you know, I remember having a fantasy once of being tied up, And it was mostly just so that I couldn't do anything. Like I would just be stuck in the bed for hours when, and everybody would go away and then I would have zero responsibilities because nothing could get done, you know? So sometimes the fantasies go way beyond where we let ourselves go or beyond, not in terms of sex, but in terms of like, wow, what would actually nourish me? Yeah. And this is a place too, where I talk to people about, it doesn't need to be about like intercourse, for instance, or sex, whatever that is, it doesn't have to be about orgasm. Like your partner's going to be probably more willing to play if it's the whole playground and not this pressure that we have to do particular things to a particular point. Right. Right. Like that particular goal, we've got to strive for it. I mean, I think, I think sex can be so much better than most people realize. And I think when, if you have a partner who is, is the lower desire, I don't want to say always, that your sex life isn't as amazing as it could be. But I think often someone's desire will increase or there will be a curiosity about like, I wonder what could happen when there is that kind of play that you're talking about. Like, wow, I didn't even know that my heart could open, uh, my heart could orgasm too. Or I didn't even know that, you know, we could actually kind of have a dance you know, I didn't, I, I like to help people expand the definition of sex too. And it sounds like you have that as well, right? Where it's not just intercourse. It's not just genitals. It's like, oh my gosh, we could stare into each other's eyes and breathe together and feel, you know, an energy circuit between us. Like that can be as pleasurable for some people as having genital intercourse. Yep. We're definitely on the same page with that. <laughs> Anything I have missed in terms of what you recommend if people talking to their partners about their sexual desires? I think one thing is just to remember that it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't go well in the moment. I mean, you, I think you can do it in the moment. And I highly suggest in the moment, if something doesn't feel good. And I know I, again, as a pleaser, or you could say as a woman, I'm not sure, but I was raised like, don't really say if you don't like something, you know? Yeah. So it's hard for me to say in the moment, like, Hey, could, could we switch it up this way? Or could you try less pressure or, you know, but if we don't say those things, Mm -hmm. then 
we, again, eventually I get frustrated or resentful or it doesn't feel good. I don't really want to do it anymore. Right. So there are those conversations that I think are really important in the moment. And then I also think it's important outside the moment, n- not when we're about to have sex or not when we're in the middle of it, to have more of a, a general conversation, like how is our sex life going for you? And here's how it's going for me. And you know, to be in communication about it as we would be about our children or our finances or how we want to decorate our home. It kind of just blows me away that people aren't having these conversations. Yeah. It blows me away too, but yeah, but I also get it because generally people are not raised with these conversations, you know, taught that this is taboo. So it's a hard thing to do. Yeah. And we, you know, for those people who do have kids, it's like, wow, this con- so by the time you you have a moment, you know, sometimes you want to have sex instead of talk about sex, which <laughs> is totally fine too. Uh, and I think it is important to collaborate and be on the same team and have some of these conversations. Yeah. So where can people find you? What do you, what do you want them to know about you and what you have to offer? Yeah. My website is shanajamescoaching.com and Shana is S-H-A-N-A. I did a TEDx. So if you do shanajamescoaching.com slash TEDx, uh, my TEDx was called What a Thousand Men's Tears Reveal About the Crisis Between Men and Women. And there are guides and gifts and stuff like that on that page as well. But I think to me, it's, it's one of the topics that feels important with many men. There's a high rate of suicide, of depression, of anxiety for men. And so that talk is really a lot about how can we come together and how can we all feel supported and not blamed or shamed or attacked. Yeah, great. I'll share the link uh, in the show notes too, so people have access. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family you can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.